Moby Dick, Chapters 64 to 67. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, Chapters 64 to 67. Chapter 64 Stubbs' Supper. Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men, with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig-lead in bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then, handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, Yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And, though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought from the sound of the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored, tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows. The whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessel's, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together, like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines, while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale, when moored alongside, is by the flukes or tail and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small strong line is prepared with a wooden float at its outer end, and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now having girdled the whale the chain is readily made to follow suit, and being slipped along the body is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End of footnote. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in, that the stead Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale, as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, 
a stake ere I sleep. You, Dagoo, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small. Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before receiving the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen, black waters, and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge, globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark that they thus leave in the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though, amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea-fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them, and though, while the valiant butchers over the deck-table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasselled, the sharks, also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat, and though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking, sharkish business enough for all parties, and though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, symmetrically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions, when sharks do most socially congregate, and most hilariously feast, yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers, and in gayer or more jovial spirits, than around a dead sperm whale, moored by night to a whale-ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil-worship, and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But as yet Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips. "'Cook! Cook! Where's that old fleece?' he cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper and at the same time darting his fork into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. "'Cook! You, cook! Sail this way, cook!' The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley, for like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee-pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard when, with both hands folded before him, and resting on his two-legged cane, 
he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head, so as to bring his best ear into play. Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth, don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook, it's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side. Don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they are welcome to help themselves civilly, and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. Blast me, if I can hear my own voice. Away, Cook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern. Snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to them. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks, and then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea, so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice, began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, I was ordered here to say that you must stop that damn noise there. You hear? Stop that damn smacking of the lips. Massa Stubb say that you can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchings, but by gore you must stop that damn racket. Cook! here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook! Why, damn your eyes! You mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, Cook. Go on, go on. Well, then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax em to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Though you is all sharks, and by nature very voracious, Yet I say to you, fellow critters, dat dat voraciousness, top dat damn slappin' of the tail. How you tink to hear, s'pose you keep up such the damn slappin' and bitin' dare? Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him, I won't have that swearing. Talk to em gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is sharks, sartin. But if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from dat whale. Don't be tearing to blubber out of your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark dood right as tudder to dat whale? And, by gore, none of you has the right to dat whale. Dat whale belong to someone else. I know some of you has berry brig mouth, brigger than others. But then de big mouth sometimes had the small bellies, so that the brigness of de mouth is not to swallow with, but to bit off de blubber for de small fry of sharks that can't get into the scrounge to help themselves. "'Well done, old fleece!' cried Stubb. "'That's Christianity. Go on.' "'No use going on. The damn willins will keep a scourging and a slapping each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn gluttons as you call em, till their bellies is full, and their bellies is bottomless.' And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on de coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul I am about of the same opinion, so give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cursed fellow critters! Kick up the damnedest row as ever you can. Fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die. Now, Cook, said Stubb, 
resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand just where you stood before there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All attention, said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, cook? What dat to do with the take? said the old black testily. Silence! How old are you, cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, cook? Hind a hatchway, in ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, cook. "'Didn't I say to Roanoke country?' he cried sharply. "'No, you didn't, Cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale-steak yet.' "'Bress my soul if I cook another one,' he growled, angrily turning round to depart. "'Come back here, Cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked take I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more, do you belong to the church? "'Passed one once in Cape Town,' said the old man sullenly. "'And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, "'where you doubtless overheard a holy parson "'addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow-creatures, have you, Cook? "'And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh?' said Stubb. "'Where do you expect to go to, Cook?' "'Go to bed very soon.' he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean, when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he hisself won't go nowhere, but some bressed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? and fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongs straight over his head, and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? and now look yourself and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lover's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but it must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders, do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap the other atop your heart. "'when I'm giving my orders, Cook.' "'What? That your heart, there? That's your gizzard! Aloft, aloft! That's it, now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention.' "'All attention,' said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. "'Well then, Cook,' You see, this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do, so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? 
And now to morrow, cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper to-morrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Hello! Stop! Make a bow before you go. Avast! Heaving again! Whale-balls for breakfast. Don't forget. Wish, by gore, whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than Massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 the whale as a dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eat him by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry the Eighth's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that, among his hunters at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales. But the Eskimos are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales, and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the mouldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp, and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' doughnuts or oily cooks when fresh. They have such an edible look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try-watches of the night it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship-biscuit into the huge oil-pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess, in flavor somewhat resembling calves' heads, which is quite a dish among some epicures and every one knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calves' brains, 
by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not perhaps entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it too by its own light, but no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine, it will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife-handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With a feather of the same fowl, and with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66 The Shark Massacre when, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, that is, two and two, for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so for six hours, say, on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous veracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding which, in some instances, only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequod sharks, though to be sure any man unaccustomed to such sights, to have looked over her side that night, would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese, and those sharks the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when, accordingly, Queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks, for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side, and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid seas, these two mariners, darting their long whaling spades, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks, by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, 
seemingly their only vital part. Footnote. The whaling spade used for cutting in is made of the very best steel, is about the bigness of a man's spread hand, and in general shape corresponds to the garden implement after which it is named, only its sides are perfectly flat, and its upper end considerably narrower than the lower. This weapon is always kept as sharp as possible, and when being used is occasionally honed, just like a razor. In its socket a stiff pole from twenty to thirty feet long is inserted for a handle. End of footnote. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but, like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones, after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn engine. Chapter 67 Cutting In It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up ten thousand red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green, and which no single man can possibly lift, this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top, and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block the great blubber-hook, weighing some one hundred pounds, was attached, and now, suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook, just above the nearest of the two side fins. This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, every bolt in her starts like the nail-heads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift startling snap is heard, with a great swash the ship rolls upward and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it for the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. 
The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, and every one present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long keen weapon called a boarding sword, and, watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked, so as to retain a hold upon the blubber, in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong desperate lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the long upper strip, called a blanket piece, swings clear, and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away, and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath, into an unfurnished parlour called the Blubber Room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of pleated serpents. And thus the work proceeds, the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heavers singing, the blubber-room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ships straining, and all hands swearing occasionally, by way of assuaging the general friction. End of chapter 64 to 67